Orthodox Easter this Sunday. And so she was playing some music from that service. So, so I would like us to uh, open in prayer, please. So would you pray with me? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we thank you for this day and we rejoice in it. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to better understand the suffering of your children in Syria and grant us the courage to act. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So uh, again, we have a guest here from Westminster, uh, Wilmington and from OVPC, uh, and, and you'll gather why we're doing this together as, as the morning goes on. Um, about three years ago here in Ocean View Presbyterian, we had Billy Sutter from the Syria-Lebanon Partnership Network spend the weekend with us, giving us an overview of the situation in Syria. Then last year, Ocean View and Westminster Wilmington partnered in providing some emergency food supplies to families in Syria, and to help Lebanese families repair their homes after that disastrous explosion in Beirut. Westminster has taken the lead on interfacing with Syria and Lebanon, and they've been leveraging their existing relationships with in-country organizations such as the Fellowship of Middle East Evangelical Churches, also known as FMEC or FEMIC, and then also the uh, uh, Syria-Lebanon Partnership Network. Today, we'll be hearing an update on the situation in Syria and the latest initiative to provide goats and bees and sheep to local fans. I uh, uh, want to especially welcome Mary Vane and Michelle Butler, who are our mission committee counterparts in Westminster, as well as these other members of Westminster who have joined us today to hear this update about Syria. We are also honored to have with us today Rosangela Jajour, who's currently the General Secretary, essentially the CEO, of the Fellowship of Middle East Evangelical Churches. Rosangelo, Rosangela is from, coming today from us, from, to us today from Beirut, Lebanon. She is truly a citizen of the world. She was born in Brazil, but moved to Syria at the age of four and completed her preparatory education there, getting her training as an elementary teacher. In 1975, she married Mr. Riyad Jarjour and moved to Lebanon, where she got a BA in Christian education and a diploma in teaching from the Near East School of Theology in Beirut. In 1983, she enrolled in the Master's of Theology Education at McCormick Theology Seminary in uh, Chicago, Illinois. And from 82, from 83 to 2002, she worked as the co-director of the Aya Napa Conference Center at the monastery located in Cyprus. That center is an ecumenical center in which local, regional, and international meetings, seminars, and conferences are held throughout the year. In, 1990, in 1983, she was elected as the, to the first of two terms to the World Council of Churches Central Committee at the World Council of Churches General Assembly in Vancouver, and she was attending then as a youth delegate. In 1991 to 2016, she was elected for four terms as General Secretary, equivalent of CEO, of the Fellowship of Middle East Evangelical Churches, an organization that brings together the Episcopal, Lutheran, and Reformed Protestant churches of the Middle East. So with that as our background, uh, we're going to do a bit of a screen sharing because we have uh, a presentation that we will walk through and explain the background here. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Michelle, who will then kind of go through the rest and say we will get to, well, there's our agenda for today. So we did the welcome introductions. Uh, we're going to go through the, the background of the crisis and what's going on and more background on FMEEC. And then talk about some of the uh, activities we've been involved here last year and now this year. And then there will be an opportunity for some Q&A at the end. So, Michelle, I will go on mute and you've got it. Thank you so much, Dale, for that great introduction. And uh, let me just tell you the logistics here a little bit. Uh, Rosangela is online, live. As you know, you can see her uh, there. 
But what we decided to do, just in case technology was not our friend today, uh, we recorded her audio, well, she sent it to us. And what I did is I took her audio portions and I created just a short video. It's about 20 minutes of, uh, of Rosangela informing us about kind of what's going on in Syria today, a little bit of the history, um, and then talk about the emergency food packages that we worked on together. And then we'll go back into live presentation once this uh, is done. So I'm gonna switch over to a video now. So you'll listen to Rosangela's voice that she just recorded, but you'll be watching a video that you'll be able to see um, some pictures as we go. So here we go. Good morning to you all, dear friends. And I pray that uh, you are all enjoying this beautiful Sunday morning, wherever you are. It's my pleasure to be with you and to share with you about the background on situation in Syria. This I shall do with the help of a good script sent to me from Reverend Dr. Harutyun Selimian, president of the Armenian Protestant community in Syria, who also sends his regards to you. The Syrian war is not only one of the bloodiest conflicts in the world. It's also one of the most complex. Now it's the 10th year. The Syrian conflict has led to more than 500,000 deaths and displaced an estimated 13 million, over half of Syria's pre-war population. Over 6.2 million Syrians are internally displaced and 5.6 million are refugees. In the 10th year of this crisis, the humanitarian needs in Syria remain staggering in terms of scale, severity, and complexity. Tensions across Northeast Syria remained high between the self-administration security forces and the government's forces, with isolated yet regular attacks recorded in the southern uh, of al hasaka Kamishli, Al-Raqqa, and Deir Zor governorates. Unfortunately, dear friends, Syria faces enormous changes, challenges, uh, well beyond the rebuilding of infrastructure and housing. It will also need assistance to restart its economy, stabilize its currency, and renew its public services, in particular education, health, electricity, and water. The current situation in Syria is untenable. People are on the verge of starvation and dying. Children are extremely malnourished because food has become unaffordable for the families. People stand in line for hours for a loaf of bread. Food prices have risen by 300% in the past year. The economic situation is causing a famine. For many families, livelihoods have become unaffordable. Unfortunately, people in Syria have reduced the number of meals from three to two a day. Many stay with just one meal, believe it or not. The fuel shortage crisis worsened further in Syria in early 2021 limiting Syria's access to fuel and reducing fuel supply in, my, in the markets. Unilateral measures on the country and the weakening of the Syrian pound have, are believed to be key drivers of the fuel shortage, limited access to fuel. Moreover, the Central Bureau of Statistics of Syria reported an average inflation rate of 200% in 2020 compared to 2019, with goods inflation reaching 300%. The food security situation in Syria has also worsened over the past year, with 12.4 million people estimated to be food insecure in 2020. This represents an increase of 4.5 million people 
which means 57% of the whole population compared to 219, including twice as many severely food insecure people, 1.3 million people. Electricity is another major issue in Syria. Imagine having two hours of electricity a day. This is a huge crisis for Syria. All social structures have disappeared in recent years as half of the population has fled. Together with the churches and the community-based organizations, we are trying hard to fill the gap in order to help the Syrian families and satisfy a very small part of their needs. Before the civil war, Syria had a healthy economy and a large stable middle class. Today, my friends, at least 137,000 Syrian children under the age of five suffer from acute malnutrition. In addition, one in eight children has a growth delay. As much as the people of Syria are eager to rebuild their country, right now the economy is being strangled and people have entered the survival mode. Today, the average wage of a professional person educated living in Syria is equivalent to just $50. It's estimated that 80% of the population now live below the poverty line and it is now common for people just to queue simply for to buy bread. Um, this is a country, my friends, before the war was the breadbasket of the Middle East. That's how it was called. The sight of homeless people and beggars in the streets is now common, something which was unheard of before the war. The economic sanctions imposed by the USA and the European Union on Syria have brought the economy to a standstill. But the European Union indicates that it will always provide humanitarian aid and points to Assad, President Assad, I mean. This sometimes make it almost impossible for aid organizations to reach the people who need help. There must be a dramatic change to turn the tide because every Thing we as a church do in Syria is just a drop in the ocean. Social immorality issues have increased because of extreme poverty. A few months ago, UN Special Rapporteur Professor Elena Dohan appealed for the United States to lift its economic sanctions that cruelly punish Syrian people. The special rapporteur stated that the USA sanctions violate the human rights of the Syrian people and make worse the already dire humanitarian, humanitarian situation in Syria, especially the, uh, during the course of COVID-19 pandemic by blocking, blocking aid, trade and investment necessary for Syria um, the health system and economy uh, are deteriorating much, much more. The humanitarian situation in Syria is, my friends, very desperate. Sanctions are affecting the most vulnerable, the poor, the people who have no power in their hands. This is why sanctions on Syria must end. And I can add more to say that you can play a role in pushing this to happen, to stop sanctions on Syria. This is the time to give you uh, an idea who we are and what we do as Fellowship of the Middle East Evangelical Churches. Uh, FMIC brings together 17 synods, councils, unions, and individual churches belonging to the Anglican, Reformed, and Lutheran traditions in the Middle East and North Africa region. FMIC sponsors countless inter-church activities and holds many workshops, seminars, and conferences with the aim of building capacities of member churches' leaders by providing resources and training programs. 
This covers the fields of theology, women, Christian education, media production, and church-related schools. I wish here to highlight, especially a ministry close to my heart for the children in Syria, and which grew very fast from 550 children in 2017 to 2,500 children and 270 volunteers working with them in 2020. This ministry covers 18 Arab and Armenian Protestant churches all over Syria, and it has been a great blessing for our children and churches alike. FMIC has always been blessed to carry on special ministries to churches in Iran since 1992 and churches in Syria since 2012. These programs are especially designed to meet the needs of these specific member churches as they continue to face difficulties of all sorts. I wish to expand uh, a bit here on FMIC's intervention in Syria since um, this meeting today is addressing Syria. Uh, since 2012, which was um, limited to facilitating in, in 212, I mean, the ministry was limited to facilitating delivery of cash assistant, uh, assistance sent by um, uh, very few partners to displaced uh, families and uh, implemented by its local partners, which operated as distribution hubs. Over time, FMIC uh, developed coordination structures with local partners, churches, and others to increase efficiency and effectiveness, meet the ever-growing uh, need, and help families resettle. FMIC rose to action mobilizing the Protestant churches, 27 congregations, spread all over Syria, as well as partnering with Catholic, Maronite, Syrian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox churches, and even Muslims to ease the pain and the burden of thousands of vulnerable families, Christians, and Muslims. With the help of donating agencies, religious and secular, and caring partners, FMIC has offered all types of assistance, food, clothing, hygiene, winterization, monthly cash subsidies for shelter, child care and psychological support, medical supplies, water well digging, and maintenance, rehabilitation of destroyed houses, agricultural livelihood projects. By 2021, more than 12,000 families have been living on monthly food rations delivered by FMIC. Without such rations, they would have been in far worse conditions to say the least. FMIC's humanitarian work has been genuine, based on true understanding, being exactly the place of others, of the others, and feeling their struggle and suffering their hopes and aspirations. According to the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, as of December 2020, an estimated of 11 million point one Syrians were in need of various forms of humanitarian assistance to meet their basic needs of shelter, food, water, and health. By March 2021, the number of people in need of humanitarian assistance has increased drastically to an estimated of 13.4 million. In January 2021, the average cost of WFP's standard reference food basket was 40% higher compared to July 2020, and a staggering 222% higher compared to January 2020. Food prices have increased for various reasons, including the continued devaluation of the Syrian pound, poor agriculture yields, and the subsequent reduction in domestic agriculture production, which make imports as vital food source, rising production costs, and rising fuel and gas costs, 
all of which have been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic, which you have already heard and you know about. Well, the result is a huge increase in number of families requesting food assistance from, uh, from our partners on the ground, the latter unable to include the new families for aid during the resource constraints. Here, where you have come to the rescue, and for that, we are grateful to you for supporting us with the food project. I'm here to share with you a bit about this project. I, I want to share mainly, you know, successes and achievements, first of all. This project succeeded in providing food for 889 Christian and Muslim people, including more than 400 children. The area we selected was Suwaida, Dar'a, and Damascus suburbs. Uh, there is a map um, uh, that has been prepared for you that shows where that location is. Uh, FMIC, FMIC's teams and local church partners report that the project has helped reduce food insecurity while enhancing the daily nutritional diets of uh, beneficiary families and helping them cover other critical needs like fuel, rent, schooling, and medication costs. The food assistance has certainly helped reduce tensions between host communities and internally displaced people. And also, partner hubs treated all beneficiary families with honesty, dignity, resulting in increased trust between the partner staff, volunteers, and beneficiaries. Also, the food basket contents were diverse and of excellent quality. If there's a time, I would have gone through that um, item by item, but all of them are very good for the Syrian family. The project continues to strengthen the presence of the church in this extremely complicated and challenging situation. And this is a very important point to notice. SMIC's implementing partners continue to target out of reach rural areas and marginalized communities not reached by other NGOs. And that's another uh, important point and which pushed us to go down to the southern part of Syria where very few partners go there. The project also helped increase the household financial security Food assistance has helped families use their limited household resources on other key essentials, such as schools fees, medication, rent, and other items. They find it very important for them. Well, um, over the time, we learned many things, but especially from this project. Uh, uh, we, we see that FMIC's team has grown in its professional capacity. The team has been able to effectively target beneficiaries based on need and vulnerability during the project. It's always important to assess the relevance and success of the project by obtaining feedback and beneficiaries uh, and other stakeholders on whether needs are being met and the project is being implemented at a level of high quality. Food assistance can reduce tensions resulting from parents who are unable to meet the needs of their family members. And that's important. We have um, security for the family through these um, uh, food baskets. Uh, I want also to tell you that FMIC's partner staff and volunteers encourage beneficiaries to speak and register complaints that we do in all our projects and we have done for this one so that the voices of the people are heard. 
If anyone has complained, they can tell the church or call FME hotline. Well, my dear friends, beneficiaries in all locations are incredibly grateful for this generous help. Some beneficiaries expressed their worries about whether they <laughs> would be able to go on with, uh, without the basket. Uh, the priests and pastors said this to us. The uh, effect of the food basket has gone beyond its nutritious value. It has truly helped beneficiaries cover their basic needs while upholding their dignity. That's very important for us. The partners reported that the biggest worry of beneficiaries is the continuation of the food aid, especially in the current circumstances when Syrian families are in need of help more than ever before. Finally, dear friends, and on behalf of the Fellowship of the Middle East Evangelical Churches and the Syrian families we serve, we send our special thanks to the folks at Ocean View, Westminster, and Ignite for your vital support to our ministry last year and this year. With your help, we were able to offer food, winterization, and now livelihood uh, items, God willing. God bless you and your ministry in his name. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Rosangela, for that excellent overview. And this will now segue right back into our PowerPoint presentation. And I can give you now an uh, introduction to the Syrian Livelihood Revival Project that Rosangela referred to a couple times. So the objective of this new project is to build resiliency in crisis affected communities to return to somewhat pre-crisis levels of farming production. So the project creates a food supply and it generates income to reinvest into the villages. Uh, what we are providing are sheep, goats, and bees, specifically to 50 farming families. Uh, We're going to be targeting the rural villages of Homs, Tartus, and Hama governance. Uh, this is in the more stable region of central Syria. The project will be managed by uh, FAMIC, and of, as you know, sh this is a trusted partner of ours based on our history with them. And the project is targeted to um, complete in October. It already began in April. So a little bit about why this project is SMART. Well, first of all, it addresses the root causes of the poverty, which is really an an extreme lack of food. Um, and it returns Syrians to their previous livelihoods that they already understood and enjoyed, and it puts them back in their communities that they were forced to leave. It restores hope and dignity through a very unique program that is uh, unique in the whole of area of, of Syria. And each team includes local stakeholders. So there's someone from the head of a local church, there are two people from the community, men and women. There are two week, uh, coordinators and the village Mukhtar, will, who is the leader of the village is also part of the team. Um, training is obviously not required because these recipients uh, already possess the skills for the farming activity that they are going back to. Um, and no other food aid projects are servicing these particular little uh, communities. Further, the program is compliant under current U.S. sanctions, which hopefully those will uh, change for the better soon, but currently they, the, this program does comply. Um, Christians and Muslims are beneficiaries, which helps to rebond the communities that were multi-faith prior to the war, and it gets them back um, to living peaceably amongst them uh, together. 
Uh, so then the project does promote peaceful coexistence as uh, was happening before. The community members will contribute to the needs assessment. So they are going to uh, decide amongst themselves who is the most vulnerable and who will be receiving these packages. And it has a very relatively low overhead. So how the project works is we are going to be targeting, as I said, 50 families. And we will expand to more as we see the success of this uh, kind of pilot program with the 50 families. Um, we are going to uh, be supplying the sheep, goats, and bees. Uh, but in addition to that, we will be providing the material, necessary materials too. So food for the livestock, water, other supplies for the bees and beekeeping. Um, you'll see, some, maybe you already noticed some photos of a lot of the beekeeping equipment. Um, it also will provide uh, veterinary services for the animals and their vaccinations. So in particular, the cost breakdown is for each beneficiary family, uh, it will cost around $800. And for the $800, FAMIC is able to provide uh, one of these packages. So either for goats, and you can see you get a pregnant one, um, a kid and two other females, plus the food and water and the vet services and any type of pest control. So that also would provide, that would, Another package would be three sheep or 13 beehives, including the frames and the little boxes that the bees come in and all of the equipment they would need for beekeeping. Um, the criteria, you might be wondering uh, about selection. And again, the selection will be happening uh, by the teams that are in these villages. Um, but they're going to be looking at the number of families that are living in the same household. They're looking at female-headed households as a priority. They're going to be looking at ones that might have a particular chronic disease, those that have a current lack of income and lack of agricultural services, as well as uh, people that have no livestock at all right now, and they don't have any other property assets. They would also look at what type of residence is there and what kind of unfinished building, how damaged it was during the war um, and things like that. So then this is where you come in. And uh, since both of our churches are Matthew 25 uh, churches, which as you know, our, uh, we strive to eradicate systemic poverty, dismantle structural racism and build congregational vitality, and we are looking at this project as a way to do that, to, to live out our Matthew 25 um, uh, motto. And in doing so, we'll be sharing the gospel in word and deed with our brothers and sisters in Syria. Uh, we'll hopefully, we'll be eradicating some of that systemic poverty and hopefully dismantling oppression. So we saw this as a direct link to our charge as a Matthew 25 church. And uh, what other things we can do to help is uh, we can pray for our brothers and sisters in Syria. Just the fact that someone is thinking about them and caring about them is really gives a lot of solace and hope for their future, just knowing that someone cares. Um, also, the U.S. and the EU have strict trade sanctions on Syria, as you heard Rosangela explain in the video. Um, and if you are interested in participating in some of the advocacy programs, Mary Vane is going to be leading an effort on that to change public policy. So you can contact her after this uh, to get involved with that. And then another way you can help is to support our Syrian Livelihood Revival Project that I just explained, and you can uh, donate. And if you do donate, we do have some uh, alternative gifts or echo cards, we like to call them, here at Westminster that uh, Bev is going to tell you about next. I think she's going to. <laughs> okay, well maybe. She... Bev, you're on mute. There you go. 
Hi. We are not at home, as you can probably tell, uh, and we are using different equipment than we usually do. So I'm Bev Bailey. That was Don Bailey wandering around. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here. You have lovely pictures of the goat, the sheep, and the beehive package. Uh, I have, this morning was our first opportunity to put this forward to the folks in church because it was our first day of being back uh, live. And so we had church and so we had an opportunity to, to uh, sell these beautiful cards, not donate to these beautiful cards. Um, so I think that the Echo gift cards are just such a good idea and help people understand a little bit more as to what we were doing. Uh, our church is very excited to be a part of this project, uh, and we are pleased to work with Westminster in this, and uh, it gives us an opportunity to do things as a small church that we wouldn't be able to do, so we are appreciative of all that. Uh, I don't know if anybody has questions about the cards, because you may know them better than we do. Uh, Oh, the buy the whole farm is so cute. I haven't seen that one. So uh, yeah, yeah, and I'll just add, if you are a Westminster member, you can uh, purchase the Echo gifts online. Uh, you can send a check to us, and uh, we have a table that's was set up today, but we'll also be there for the next two Sundays outside, right outside the door. Thank you, Bev. You're welcome. I think if we're ready, we can go to questions. I know that uh, you saw just an awful lot and some of it was brand new to you. So it, I'm sure that some of you have questions. I'm gonna start with a question though, because this is a question I asked Mary uh, and she said she thought maybe she'd answer it for everybody, <laughs> is how did Westminster get started with wanting to work with Syria? Uh, what happened? and then get going with Ignite and then find us as a partner. Thank you, Beth. Um, so Westminster has been involved in mission programs with Syria almost since the beginning of the war. So for about nine and a half years. And the way we approach mission is we have, um, we're split into two groups. We have an urban mission group and we have a global mission group. The global mission is for anything that's beyond 60 miles from the radius of our church. Then within global mission, uh, we can't be all things to all people. So we try to focus in three areas. One is Guatemala, which we partner with Ocean View on as well. And I see Carrie's on the line here too today. Um, one is Congo and the other is the Middle East. Within the Middle East, we focus on Israel, Palestine and Syria. We, we have pledged budget that um, has an ongoing, um, has ongoing funds to allocate to each of these mission uh, areas. And we also have another bucket that we reserve for what we call disaster relief. And there is always a disaster every year of some sort uh, that needs attention. It could be a flood, it could be a hurricane, it could be um, uh, raging forest fires, it could be COVID, or it could be COVID and a civil war. Um, so we first started by using some of our disaster relief funds and when people were fleeing their homes for safety and only taking what they had on their back and ended up in camps um, and we all thought this was a temporary thing that it would quickly be resolved people would be returning to their homes but that didn't happen and so we're in the camps they would get through get into their first winter season, the camps are very muddy. So we sent money uh, for boots for kids in the, in the camps. And then the next year, you know, it's continuing and we had a blanket drive. The following year, we uh, learned about a family, a Syrian family foundation. Uh, they're located outside of Philadelphia. 
and they were sending shipments once a month, a whole container load of goods, um, which went to the Idlib province, province in the northern part of Syria across the, um, the Turkish border. Uh, in the, we did collections with them um, about three times, and those collections consisted of items of medical needs like um, uh, wheelchairs, porta potties, crutches, bandages, aspirin, um, over the counter drugs. Uh, we also had clothing, blankets school supplies, and in the last collection, we had tools. That was a very uh, engaging project. Uh, families could participate in it. Lots of people got involved from the collection to the sorting, to the bagging, to the transporting, to Philadelphia, to loading uh, into the containers. And we did that um, as a community, well, uh, Westminster was the hub, but we engaged um, a couple Muslim um, organizations, uh, St. Joseph's Catholic Church, Beth Shalom Synagogue. So it became a wonderful uniting community activity and helped raise the awareness of the ongoing problems in Syria at that time. Um, as the war continued, um, we joined the Syria-Lebanon Partnership Network, which is a collection of um, Presbyterian leaders who are passionate about the health and well-being of Syrians and um, um, partnered with the Presbyterian Synod uh, in Syria-Lebanon. With them, we did um, uh, more disaster relief kind of activities where we funded um, food baskets, um, money for fuel, and rent subsidies. And we did that for a number of years. And um, then the same organization um, recognized the need in the Lebanese refugee camps to provide education for the kids. Uh, this was into the fifth year of the conflict and some kids had not had education during that entire time. So uh, we had a quite successful program establishing um, what became six schools uh, for, Lebanese, uh, for Syrian refugees in Lebanon. And then uh, more currently, we come up to the time of COVID. And we wanted to do something to help again from our disaster relief funds. And we said, you know, what can we do to quickly jump in and try to prevent the spread of COVID before the situation gets worse, knowing that there would be minimal um, health facilities for people um, and, and minimal treatment. So I contacted our mission coworker uh, in Beirut, whose name is Elmarie Parker. She's been to our church a couple times to speak. <laughs> I asked her for advice. She told me Famique would be a good partner for this. So that's when I got together with Rosangela and we did um, hygiene packages. Uh, when, when you're operating in an area that has conflict, there's no possibility that our members could go over and visit. We couldn't have gone over um, because of the conflict and then compound that with COVID, none of us are gonna be over visiting, um, doing fact finding, monitoring programs or auditing programs. So it is absolutely essential that we pick partners that we trust, partners that have uh, that are reliable, that have the capability, that have the skill set to provide the programs and then do a good audit and make adjustments as, as appropriate. And we found that FMEC was a great partner and therefore we decided uh, this is a partner we wanna continue our relationship with. And so we went from hygiene projects to the Ignite program, 
that we partnered with Ocean View on, that program um, provided $20,000 of funding for the food packages. Um, uh, if you don't know what Ignite is, it is a um, endowed fund that the Newcastle Presbytery has, and it is um, uh, to promote mission work, uh, both locally and globally. So we were very happy to partner on that program, and that takes us up to where we are today with our third program with FAMIC. And, and Dale, I would just sort of chime in a little bit about the opportunity that's happened here for Ocean View of being connected with a larger church, right? We're, we're able to kind of contribute and participate and learn about these international efforts. So it's been a real blessing to us here in Ocean View as well. Uh, Bev, was there other questions that you were thinking of? No, I thought I'd open it up to anyone out there who has a question about anything, well, about Syria. <laughs> <laughs> and Rosangela is on the line live, so please right. feel free to ask her questions as well. Bruce. I have a question, Dale. Bruce, go ahead. First, let me say that is an excellent presentation. And I say that because in a lot of these missionary projects, you talk about monetary giving, but you don't know how that's broken down. This specifically says what money will do what, especially for the, the farm families and the DACA. So that's well done. Um, this might be a silly kind of question, but um, is there any, from your point of view, is there any one of these projects that is more significant than others? So in other words, is anyone in more need than the other or they equally the same? Uh, Bruce, to answer your question, we've, you know, from our working together with Westminster, both on the Guatemala project and now here with Syria Lebanon, uh, the fact that, that uh, FAMIC is the, an in-country an in trusted partner and that Westminster has a good relationship with them and the Syria Lebanon Partnership Network. We, we kind of get from Westminster what the most immediate needs are in country. So what we're kind of doing on our side is making people aware of what those specific projects are and, and providing the support that we can. Like last year, it was emergency food kits. And now this year it's like, oh, wait a minute, if we can help the families you know, get back to farming, you know, that'll help, right? Um, it was alluded to a couple of times about some of the things that we as citizens can do to advocate change in our government policies about the sanctions. And that's a whole nother conversation that we could probably have another hour's conversation about, about the fact that these sanctions have caused such humanitarian need in Syria that, that you know, our voice to our Congress and our administration can help with those sanctions. So that's, that's how I see it. And that's what I see as, as being so beneficial about us small church working with a big church is that we can, we, we can have an impact. Thank you. Cindy, did you have a question? Okay, any other questions? Any, yeah, Roger. I uh, had a question about the uh, location of the uh, Syrian revival project. Bees uh, require, of course, uh, either crops to, um, you know, generate their uh, food source and or wildflowers and uh, wild trees and forests. So I appropriate, I'm hoping the appropriate geography is available for this. I'm sure that uh, I'm just interested in more about how that uh, bee thing will work. Maybe that uh, replaces traditional beekeeping that was a major Syrian livelihood before. Maybe that's the story, I don't know. Rosangela, do you want to take that? Or yes. do you want me to well, okay. I mean, if you know, you know better about this project, by the way. Thank you so much for preparing for it so beautifully. Go ahead, Mary, please. Um, so this is a, a farming region. Um, this was uh, part of the breadbasket uh, area of Syria. So um, uh, they grow wheat there. Um, so it is, it is appropriate for bee uh, keeping 
in this region. One of the things we uh, love about this project is um, rather than just be providing aid, which is needed very much, but this allows people get, to get back to doing what they used to do and, and um, create, a, create their own livelihood, uh, provide food for themselves and stimulate the, econ the local economy because the, the extra product that they have, uh, they'll be selling in the community. So, and there's been such a shortage of food. Uh, uh, we, we love to see a program that is sustainable and um, hopefully have these people be independent um, after a while and not reliant on just aid. I'm seeing yes. Elaine and Terry. Elaine? Yes, um, my question is along those lines um, in seeing the the photographs uh, and the presentation was beautiful, thank you. Uh, the photographs of, of the damage that's been done to Syria and the war and the rubble basically. Um, are there some places that have stabilized in terms of their um, being affected by that uh, war basically? Um, that, that farming, it sounds like there's an area where farming can take place and I'm just trying to resolve what's happening in the destruction versus building, rebuilding. You want me to say something here? Yes, Rosangela, please. Yes, all our projects are in safe areas, by the way. We have not been uh, involved in um, um, uh, rubble held uh, areas or uh, areas with the violence because this jeopardize projects and uh, the ongoing of uh, a normal project. So we are careful where to choose. And of course the rubble is all over us, but there are there is also big area that is now functional uh, mm. in Syria. Not all areas are uh, a war zone, except for the area of Idlib and the Northeast and Der Zor and Raqqa, that those areas are, are really unstable. The rest of it, um, the rest of Syria is now manageable. I don't say that it's beautiful and everything is good, but um, uh, we are able, we have been able to carry on quite a lot of work, including by the way, ongoing containers uh, of help, you know, that, that I didn't mention in the list of things we are doing but we are doing lots of projects all over Syria, including also rehab projects. We are involved in Hums, in a rehab project. Uh, now we have around 250 houses that we have uh, um, fixed. It's not huge fixing, but it's between, you know, 2000 up to $3,000 each where we, we, we manage to fix these houses so that we bring these families back to their houses. Uh, and and in, the, in those areas, the, the destruction is huge, but the people want to go back to their home. And many of them, they were living in these homes even without windows and they put just a blanket on the door or something and they use the space. So the destruction is big, but so is the, 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 the places that are, you know, candidate for, for um, regaining hope and normality of life. It is there. So we are not mm -hmm. afraid to get involved, but mostly we are um, careful that we choose secure places. We are not afraid of the rubble, but we are, uh, we are uh, um, careful to choose safe areas where uh, the, 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 there's a government control and police and, you know, so that people are uh, feeling safe. So that's it, you see. But yes, it needs nations. We are waiting for an international decision to rebuild Syria. We are not able to get involved in the area where we are working with rehab. There are whole, um, sectors of the cities that are on the ground. 
especially Christian areas with, with the, um, uh, lots of churches and the situation there is it's beyond our, our limited you know, um, um, ability to take care of it. We need the international community to stabilize the country and to pour in help and lift the sanctions so that the material can come in uh, to rebuild Syria. It isn't us that we are uh, able and not doing it. We need a big decision, Ellen, to do that. Thank you very much for your question. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think I'd seen Terry have a, have a question. Yeah, I, I would say that Rosangela probably began to answer my question with that very helpful answer there. Um, my question was going to be, is the government um, kind of hands off? And probably that's so. Um, this, whatever else we think of Assad's government, it was a government that tolerated multi-ethnic and multi-faith multi relationships all around the country. So. Uh, my curiosity was whether the government is staying hands off and allowing these projects to go ahead without trying to either skim or interfere or whatever else. And it sounds like you're deliberately choosing places where that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, indeed, especially because we are a church-related organization. They let us do anything, everything. Our lorries with food pass from one checkpoint to the other. We are saluted. We're encouraged, we are, our work is facilitated. We get permissions for containers before they know what is in it because we trust, they trust us. We give yes. them the list and they say, go ahead. They give us hand in the rebuilding, except that when we choose a, a, a too much destroyed areas, the government then say, no, you cannot enter into this because this is dangerous. But all the rest is allowed. We do fantastic and huge work with children yes. in, in so many locations where hundreds of children flock into our centers without the interference of any. And lately we have been even hitting um, the social media, uh, you know, different organizations, you know, naming us as doing a clean work, encouraging work, and that what we do gives people hope. So we are, we are being, you know, uh, I, I would say we get all the help we need. Thank you very much for the question. Great. Yes. Thank you, Rosangela. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing us kind of uh, getting to about our hour checkpoint. So was there any other closing questions that someone might have? All right. Well, again, I, I want to thank you all for 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 gathering here, Rosangela. Particularly, your participation today was so very helpful with all your work to get the the, the presentation pulled together. And Michelle Butler, kudos to you on on making that happen. So yeah, that was real. Good. Yes, so, indeed. <laughs> so so thank you very much uh, for the for the folks here in Ocean View. We'll be having those lovely little gift cards still out uh, available. You can also send donations into the into the church that we'll be getting then to to Westminster. And I guess uh, folks in Westminster have the same sort of uh, thing up with you. And again, I'm I'm so glad the folks in Westminster have been here. It's it's good to put some some faces to more names, and we definitely look forward to strengthening our two churches partnership as, as we go into the future. So with that, may I guess I, that passed. May I please a point of privilege, a personal one? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Guys, I want to thank you sincerely for your presence, for your active presence, active listening. I feel that you have heard me with your hearts, not only with, with your ears, but, but I'm so thankful to you for being here today to support me, to to support our work, to pray for us, to uh, to I'm sure yeah it's it's wonderful. I'm so encouraged to see you all. I want you to really pray for us um, as we go on, uh, struggling with so many um, things to be done and a little enhanced, but with the blessings of God and the good friends around like you guys. Uh, you know, uh, Mary, Michelle, for preparing and doing everything before, during, and after. 
You Thank don't you. know how much Mary worked with me, poor Mary, long <laughs> phone calls and all these, you know, and with my broken English and broken lines, but we made it. I think today we are at a privileged point. If we don't have anything, then we have you all around us to help us and support us and pray for us. Uh, uh, Yes, uh, Westminster, Ocean View, Ignite, and all the folks around the table. Oh, I'm so grateful for you. And please don't forget that you have a, a big role to play with the government itself, you know, so that we are able to together, you know, uh, do something about lifting the sanctions uh, uh, on Syria. Uh, God bless you. And until we see, maybe we see you in Syria. It's not impossible. There, are, there were lots and lots of tours coming from your country to my country, visiting the churches, getting in contact with people, seeing them face to face and building real partnership, real friendship with them. I see them on, on the Facebook. You know, and I look and I say, who brought this person from America to this person in Syria? So I am not, uh, you know, I'm hopeful. We shall definitely see you maybe next Easter. Maybe you prepare from now. We host you for Easter in Syria. God bless you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, Pastor Terry, would you just close us in a quick prayer, please? Sure. Let us pray. God of all people and God of all places, we thank you for the sheer persistence of the people of Syria, a lovely people, always a multinational, multi-fluent, multi-capable people. We thank you for the privilege of helping them build back their society. We thank you that their society has survived in its fragments. We thank you for all the work Meek has done, Westminster has done, Ignite has done, and we thank you for allowing us to come alongside. Please bless and multiply all these efforts and the efforts of so many other partners all around the world. Help governments to see the need that is more important than other political goals and to respond appropriately. Let Syria be rebuilt as its beautiful self. Let that be all of our goal and bless that goal. We pray in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. Very good. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thank, thank, thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you thank you, everyone. Blessings bye -bye. to you all. Bye-bye. God bless you. Bye-bye. Have bye supper, bye. George. George. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You blessed me so much. Thank Take you. Take care, Rosangela.